So at the beginning of lecture, or part one, I talked about the causes of climate change from a scientific perspective. Some of the very overarching impacts of climate change, so the broader ones that happen globally and are happening and will happen globally, and also the relationship of development, which is something we talk a lot about in this course, the relationship of development to the relationship of humans to nature and how that has got us to where we are. So that relationship that relies on economic growth, on extraction, on accumulation of wealth. So that brings us to this first question here, why didn't we stop that this sooner? Of course, if this huge problem that we're looking at is related to our way of development, our way of living, of accumulation and all that, it is difficult to change. It is also highly intertwined with relationships of power in society. So certain people benefit from those causes of climate change or from climate change directly. So those people who are in power for a long time are not looking to make the changes necessary. And recall that the first step in solving an, a problem is to understand the problem. You have to know that a problem exists in order to want to solve it. You have to identify and understand that problem and then move from there as a society. The problem with climate change is that it is difficult to feel those immediate effects. So it's not always visible. Uh, it's not, to a lot of us, it's not a direct threat for a lot of our lives. We can continue to live as this process is happening. It's not an immediate threat. So those effects are not immediately felt or visible. And then you also have the fact that there are there's huge campaigns to spread disinformation, to confuse the public about the realities of climate change. This is happening from the 1970s onward from the oil industry. And the purposes of those campaigns were to delay action, of course, because the oil industry would be very negatively impacted. They would lose their profits or their profits would be threatened in some way if the entire public understood the threat of climate change and what would we would have to do to halt it or to reverse it or to prevent it from getting worse. So uh, one of the biggest examples of what I'm talking about is in August of 2018, so very recently, there was a full New York Times issue that came out and I don't remember this happening in other issues where they only cover one topic. So they only covered one topic for this issue. And the, t the topic was climate change and this disinformation campaign. So what they unraveled through various investigations taking place uh, by investigative journalists and research is that in the 1970s, so these large oil companies, they had their own scientists, good scientists, because they had the money to pay these people well. So these good scientists working for these big companies, they were studying possible impacts of oil and fossil fuels on the atmosphere. And they did find that there was potential for a huge threat to the atmosphere and then to basically the Earth from the impacts of those atmospheric changes from those greenhouse gas emissions. That sort of science was established by those scientists who did that research directly for those companies. So they brought it to the attention of the companies. Companies considered making changes, but instead of doing that, what they ended up doing, so I'm telling this story from the New York Times that has all been confirmed um, on trial through the Senate. So what those companies ended up doing was 
they changed scientists. So they replaced their current scientists with scientists who they paid to publish false information. So they instead spread to the public that there was going to be no impacts or some sort of positive impacts from the emissions that were happening. So this has only recently come to light, and there are lawsuits about this, but this is the type of disinformation and confusion that the public was faced with for decades to come because the oil industry decided to look out for its profits instead of what we're facing now 40 years down the road. And recall through our topics of neoliberalism, the political weight that something like this would hold. So these huge companies, they do have a lot of political clout. They can lobby, they can really affect politics and policy. So since that time, scientists continue, I mean the ones who weren't being paid by the oil industry, they continue to publish information saying we have this threat of the way that we're living now is going to have some serious consequences not that far from now. So they continue to get this information out. Uh, huge efforts are concerted in making sure that that is understood. So luckily now we are at a point where most people are on board with the idea that climate change is real. It's happening. It's something we need to think about. But the oil industry, so they recognize this as well. They recognize in most parts of the world, maybe not in some parts, uh, in most parts of the world, their efforts of trying to tell people that climate change isn't real, that emissions aren't having any sort of impact, they realize that that is not going to work anymore. So they changed the tactics. And you will see, if you ever Google climate change, anything like this, I know that I get uh, notifications of new articles that are coming up. So I see headlines like this all the time. When you see these headlines, you have to consider the source because a lot of these sources are not legitimate. They are not themselves researchers. And or a lot of them are working for the oil industry. So I've seen, in fact, this first one. So an ice age is coming in a thousand years. There's no point of making these changes because we're all doomed. So any changes we have now, it's all part of a larger change that's happening with the Earth's atmosphere. So there's no point in fighting these changes. It's going to happen regardless. It's part of Earth's natural cycles. So I've seen this publication. Yes, there are some Earth's natural cycles, but that doesn't mean that we need to escalate them and uh, see what we're seeing today and into the near future. Um, I've seen this article and the person who wrote it and who spread this type of information, like oil sands employee is in their signature, not employee, but like oil sands manager of a specific company. So there's all sorts of information that comes out like this. So climate change, this is the total 180, right, of climate change isn't real. Now it's climate change is so severe, it's already happened, there's nothing we can do, there's no point. Kind of similar to the Ice Age one. Climate change will be beneficial. So I've heard that one as well. I think I even heard it in this class. Um, that's usually almost 100% of the time. So if it's not coming from a source that is illegitimate anyways, like a BuzzFeed, that is usually coming from someone who benefits from the oil industry or who works for the oil industry. So climate change will be beneficial in some sort of way. Um, People have optimal production at a higher temperature, so higher temperature is going to make us more productive. That's one I've heard in terms of climate change being beneficial. Um, climate change will open up the Arctic to better agriculture, stuff like that. Uh, there's one that persists in Alberta. 
this is, um, so our oil is the most ethical in Canada, so we should really focus on that. We should make, we should really focus on that sector because we have the best, most socially ethical oil. Uh, the person that wrote that book, his name's Ezra Levant. It's called Ethical Oil. It came out in 2010. He is an oil sands lawyer, so he does get paid as well by that industry to construct that story. And the entire story is just like Saudi Arabia is backward, Russia is backward. Why are we? It's exactly what we talk in this course. So painting other people as backward, um, saying that we shouldn't be supporting their industries, we should be supporting Canada. So it's I mean, there's some merit to that argument, I guess, but why wouldn't the answer then just be to look for a transition away from oil instead of like shifting the problem to Canada? Why wouldn't we just try and shift away from oil altogether? Because in the end, oil now, we know, itself is unethical. It is creating problems that will last into the future. We are hurting people, future generations, by continuing to focus so much on the growth of the oil industry. So my message here is that it's important to check your sources, because I do get these questions. And I do trace those headlines to people who work in the oil industry. So you should always question your sources. So climate change as a global process. So this is a good question for the test. I'm glad you're all here today. This topic as well as my next topic. These are good test questions because you know that our questions have to relate to the broader topics of the course. So carbon emissions differ according to geography. So there's various ways that geography is a global process. So that differentiation in emissions according to country, region, that's a geographical process. I'll show you this map. So from the World Bank, the darker blue is higher emissions per capita. So per capita means per person. So you can see that the global north is a lot more higher, higher numbers, the emissions per capita, than the global south, um, excluding Australia and looks like South Africa as well has high numbers of emissions. So the more developed countries across and then Saudi Arabia is in there as well, the darkest blue, for obvious reasons. So you see that those biggest emitters are parts of the global north, including Australia. They fit into that global north, what characterizes those countries other than where they are on the map. Australia fits those characteristics as well. So based on that differentiation, who should be responsible for reducing emissions and addressing climate change? So that is one question that pervades our understanding of how we should go about thinking about climate change. One way to look at it is who's causing it. But it's also important to recognize that There's a different map. So this map that I showed you, that is the emissions per capita. And you see the global north is the largest, um, Canada and the United States, Australia, huge players. But if you just look at emissions point blank, you will see India and China as the largest because they just simply have the largest amount of people by far. So you can see where it starts to get complicated of who should be responsible. It's also complicated by, oh, I've gone too far. It's also complicated by the fact that the largest impacts of climate change will actually be in the global south. So those regions 
there was a slide previously where it showed drought forecasts and drought, how droughts have happened. So you can see the brighter red spots are right across the global south. So droughts are going to more strongly imp impact the global south. And not only that, the people there are going to be the most vulnerable to these changes. So they, it's more difficult for them to overcome these problems very easily because they don't have many resources available to them. So they are more vulnerable to these changes and they will face worse changes. There's people who live off the land and there's people who um, obtain subsistence off the land. Those people will be affected by droughts or floods or by their land going underwater because of the rising sea levels. So all of these impacts will affect huge numbers of people across the global south. And this is my example of um, the effects of climate change. So in terms of weather events, droughts, floods, wildfires, stuff like that, that is quite widespread. Droughts will be more severe in the south, but it doesn't mean that we don't face problems in the global north, but it does mean that they're able to be worked around easier for people who have access to a lot of wealth, for example. So um, LeBron James, he's come up in one of my other lectures because he gets, it was our fashion lecture, so he in royalties is estimated to make a billion dollars over his lifetime just from Nike, not even his career. It's like a side career. So LeBron James, October 28th, very recent. His house was, I guess, engulfed or under threat of being engulfed by fire from wildfires in LA. And so he tweeted about it. Those are his tweets. So these LA fires ain't no joke or aren't no joke. Had to emergency evacuate my house and I've been driving around with my family trying to get rooms. No luck so far. And then you see like a minute later, finally found a place to accommodate us. So he, he's gonna be okay under this type of circumstances. People who aren't gonna be okay are those who have no other option other than where they're living now. Uh, they don't have access to alternative ways to eat food. The food where they are is the food that they have. That's all the stuff that they have. They don't have these sorts of options to just up and move, find a hotel when things go awry. Uh, and that is where we get climate refugees. So that's gonna be huge change that's gonna happen and has been happening. So with this understanding, right, knowing that a lot of the global north, a lot of the wealthier people in these developed nations are gonna be okay, why should they have to make those changes, right? Because it's not the problem that we're facing. Shouldn't it be the problem, the people who are facing those problems more seriously take on those responsibilities for changing? So you see how it can be complicated when we're talking about who and where should take on those solutions. There are some examples. One example is the Kyoto Protocol. So that takes on that idea that it is the developed countries, the higher per capita emitters that should play a larger role in trying to reduce fossil fuel emissions and at the same time trying to support other countries in developing in a way that will also not lead to a ton more emissions. Of course, there is resistance to that type of policy, especially plays out in this us versus them. So why am I going to do this for another country? Um, what's, what's in it for me? Why am I helping them out? Why am I helping out the other? We also see it play out in a what about China narrative. So what I mean by that is, um, what's the point of me doing anything if China's not changing? China's the one that needs to change. I, I'm saying it as other people say it. So China's the one that needs to change. Uh, until they do that, 
there is nothing that we can do. So that's something actually that Donald Trump says. So that's why he, that's some of the remarks that he gives after removing uh, environmental protections, going back onto coal, and he's taken himself out of the Paris Agreement, or he's started that process of getting the US to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, saying, well, if China's not doing whatever they can, there's no point in us taking on that initiative. We are not the leaders. We don't want to be the leaders. We'll, we'll, do, we'll step up when other countries do. So that's a huge narrative. Um, to be honest, China and India do present a large, um, they have a lot of weight in the future of emissions because a lot of people living in China, there's just so many people, a lot of people living in China and living in India do not currently have electricity. They don't have power, like literal power. Um, so the debate is when they get on the grid, when they access power, if they go via coal, there's going to be a huge increase in emissions globally. Whereas if they electrify themselves, get on the grid via renewable energy, it's going to make a huge difference to the projected amount of emissions in the future. So there are real questions that do stem from China and from India. And in a film, in the film that we watched in class last week, so in Before the Flood, Leonardo DiCaprio, he interviews uh, Sarita Narain of India. She's their environmental minister. And she questions him saying, why should we, why are we being held to this standard when you weren't held to the standard of getting on renewables? Why should it be us? All we want is power. These people need power. You guys had that luxury 50 years ago, even more than that, 70 years ago. We have not had that luxury and we want access to that. Coal happens to be the cheapest and easiest way to do that. So why should we listen to you and use wind power, use solar power, when we have this available and it's the easiest and quickest? So good questions being raised. All that being said, you have, unfortunately, a continuous relinquishing of responsibility when we ask these questions. So if this person isn't doing anything or if this government or country isn't thinking about it, there's no point. So I want to question that. I do not believe that. A lot of people do not believe that sort of narrative. We have to remember we are global citizens. So that's where this climate change topic really contrasts a lot of what we learn in this course and this push for post-global. So these nationalist narratives, the understandings of the other, thinking about refugees as terrorist threats and trying to keep them out of our countries, trying to uh, move to more sovereign food for the benefit of workers, uh, getting off those global markets. We talked about the problems with the housing industry as well, the global housing market, and how that can impact such a large number of people through abstract means. This is different. So while all of that is moving towards the post-global, climate change reminds us that we are global citizens. We are all intertwined in this. We will all be affected, yes, differently, but we are, will all be affected and we all have a role to play, no matter where we're from. So yes, through histories of uneven development, so through the productions of that, and like I talked about, the vulnerability that exists across a lot of the global south, yes, the biggest impacts will be in the global south, but that will affect us no matter where we are. So that's one thing to understand as well. Two big examples. One of them is a predicted example, um, an upcoming climate scenario. The other one has already happened. So it's understood that the huge civil war in Syria, 
a lot of what sparked the conflict, yes, there was um, political strife, economic strife. A lot of that was linked to a significant five-year drought. It's a once in every 900-year event. That's how often it's supposed to happen, but it happened for five years straight. So it really caused things to spiral out of control. There was a lot of civil unrest and then a military crackdown. That is the civil war in Syria. It has displaced millions of people. Hundreds of thousands of people have been killed. Civ civilians have been killed. Innocent people. And that is something that affects us all. Um, first of all, you should feel some empathy, but also because of the mass migration. So I th think the number is 9 million people having been displaced. So a lot of them go to Turkey. Um, now there's even civil problems in Turkey related to this. Going to different parts of Europe, you have Brexit really, um, this whole migration playing a role. So it's kind of an anti-immigration movement. It's affecting people all over. So these events will continue to happen, unfortunately. War and climate refugees is going to play a significant role in the global connectedness, connectedness aspect of this problem. You also have with the IPCC reports, um, so the International Panel on Climate Change, their very stark predictions of what's going to happen in the future. The thing with the IPCC reports as well is that those are a collection of like thousands of scientists who work all over the world. And a lot of those scientists, their work gets approved by their relevant government. So these aren't the extreme predictions. Like these are not people who are pushing the boundaries with their predictions. A lot of the predictions are moderated because they need to be get to get approved by the government who is more uh, sort of conservative and not wanting to have these huge threats be published. So these reports are quite realistic. They are not extreme. They're like quite certain the IPCC ones. So with what they report um, and how that relates to Mexico is that 50% of the farmland that exists will no longer be able to exist in a short 12 years. It will probably be 11 by now. You can imagine the impact that that will have on the current situation of migrants moving and escaping where they are, moving to get into the US. This has also already had huge impacts on um, violence being sparked in the US. It has huge impacts on the refugees themselves, of course. But what I'm saying is that affects you no matter where you are. So even though it's a Mexico problem, it's an everywhere problem. This has implications for countries like Canada and the United States that are considered right or wrong. They're considered havens. So places for people to go who are in strife. And I took this quote from a person named Glenn Murray. He's a politician. He's the first gay mayor of any large city in the world. He was the mayor of Winnipeg formerly, and then he worked for the Ontario government for quite a while, but now he's a retired politician. And I went to a talk that he put on Earlier this semester, it was a talk on the New Green New Deal, and I'll talk about what that is in a few minutes. But this is something that he said, and it really speaks to contesting this narrative of saying, it's not my responsibility, it's not going to affect us. So he talks about uh, being Canadian. And this quote was directly in response to someone who was asking that question, what about China? If China doesn't do anything, there's no point in us as Canadians in doing anything because overall, even though there's a high number, amount of emissions per capita by Canadians, there's not a lot of Canadians. So 
ultimately, Canada actually only has about 2% of global emissions that we're responsible for. So the question was, like, why should we be doing anything? We, we just, it's such a small percent. So his response is being Canadian, I link it to this course, so, or a global citizen, is having the courage to stare down and fight oppression and hatred, to go to war when necessary. It's having the compassion to have a humanitarian response when there is crisis in the world. It is the idea of being a haven and welcoming people when no one else will. But more than anything else, it's not about measuring ourselves by how big a part of the problem we are, but how big a part of the solution we can be. So that's an important way to think about this. So what we understand from this is that we do need to act. I put a link to a short video. We don't have to watch it. It's from the movie that I've referenced several times now, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. It's the final speech that he gives at the UN. I uh, suggest that you watch it on your own time just because it's a great video. Should we just watch it? It's only two minutes long. Let's watch it. I hope this doesn't complicate the sound that's happening right now. The last speaker for this signing ceremony is the Academy Award Best Actor and the United Nations Messenger of Peace, Mr. Leonardo DiCaprio. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for the honor to address this body. And thanks to the distinguished climate leaders assembled here today who are ready to take action. As a UN messenger of peace, I've traveled all over the world for the last two years. I've seen cities like Beijing choked by industrial pollution, ancient boreal forests in Canada that have been clear cut and rainforests in Indonesia that have been incinerated. In India, I met farmers whose crops have been literally washed away. In America, I've witnessed sea level rise flooding the streets of Miami. In Greenland and in the Arctic, I was astonished to see that ancient glaciers are rapidly disappearing well ahead of scientific predictions. All that I have seen and learned on my journey has absolutely terrified me. Now think about the shame that each of us will carry when our children and grandchildren look back and realize that we have the means of stopping this devastation, but simply lack the political will to do so. Yes, we have achieved the Paris Agreement. More countries have come together here to sign this agreement today than for any other cause in the history of humankind, and that is reason for hope. But unfortunately, the evidence shows us that it will not be enough. A massive change is required right now, one that leads to a new collective consciousness, a new collective evolution of the human race, inspired and enabled by a sense of urgency from all of you. We can congratulate each other today, but it will mean absolutely nothing if you return to your countries and fail to push beyond the promises of this historic agreement. After 21 years of debates and conferences, it is time to declare no more talk no more excuses, no more 10-year studies, no more allowing the fossil fuel companies to manipulate and dictate the science and policies that affect our future. The world is now watching. You will either be lauded by future generations or vilified by them. You are the last best hope of Earth. We ask you to protect it, or we and all living things we cherish are history. Right, so same message as me, just a lot fancier and better, better cinematography. So that was at the Conference of the Parties, COP, in 2015, and it was the, he was congratulating them on finalizing the Paris Agreement that was later ratified by most countries, but unfortunately, like I said, Donald Trump is pulling out of that agreement. As of recently, he started the actual legal actions to withdraw. So, it is important to understand that we need to act. 
we all have a role to play. So yes, governments have more of a role than people who do not directly control policy, but there is something that all of us can do. And thinking about policy solutions, I'm just going to briefly talk about those. So there's different market uh, mechanisms to try and control for emissions. Examples are cap and trade that was implemented in Ontario and revoked by Doug Ford. That was a good one because it also had an equity focus. So the money that was um, charged to different industries, the biggest emitters, it would be used for some sort of social equity good. It would also be used to spur innovation in those industries. So it was, it's actually quite an economically progressive policy that was in place. Um, so it's not trying to necessarily screw companies over. Um, and it was widely accepted by those companies as well. It wasn't thoroughly opposed as Doug Ford makes it out to be. Um, a lot of the industries and the union heads at those industries, they were in favor of this sort of idea that was a market me mechanism, but it also focused on equity. Carbon offsets and carbon tax are other market mechanisms. So playing into sort of consumer demand and consumption, trying to reduce from that end doesn't always work, but there's definitely some merits to it. Divestment is a very strong market mechanism. So that is the idea. It just has such a big impact. So institutional investors especially, so places like U of T, think of all the tuition paid by people in this room alone. So multiply that by the 80,000 students that are at U of T. U of T has access to a lot of funds and they invest those funds to generate more wealth every year. Increase through interest their investments. So places like U of T and different investment funds, even like provinces have them. There's tons of money to be invested in the world. Forcing those institutional investors to invest their money into equitable or environment, environmentally sound investments, ethically sound investments, is actually a very effective tool. And also suggesting that they divest from environmentally problematic companies. So you can imagine the impact that would have on that company, right? If you get an institution like U of T to divest hundreds, maybe not hundreds, tens of millions of dollars from that company, it has a huge impact on that company. So it forces them to consider that impact that they're having and to change, to get ahead of further divestments, and to make some positive changes. So 350.org, I put the website there, is a, it's all about divestment. It's a company or a not-for-profit that is run in part by Naomi Klein, the author of today's readings. She does work for this organization. She's on the board. And it organizes various pushes for divestment. U of T has its own 350.org chapter to ensure that U of T is investing ethically. And that sort of investment also, also affects Canada on a whole. So even this semester, uh, I think it was late September, there was a huge divestment from all Canadian companies. So a Norwegian pension fund, it has people's pensions, they have a lot of excess money to invest. Uh, they said that Canada, it's funding oil sands, it's no longer in their interests to be connected to something like that. So they withdrew tens of millions of dollars as well, just from Canada as a whole. So thinking about the economic impacts that can be attenuated onto companies through divestment is a interesting way to think about this because surely it does push them to change. A lot of the problem is with these market-based solutions, they do leave other problems untouched. So they do not address 
bigger issues in society. And if you recall, a lot of this relates to bigger issues in society. So these relationships of what development is, the relationships to nature, affects a lot of different other relationships. So the relationships of oppression towards women, towards racialized populations, towards indigenous populations, towards the lower classes, people who have less power and the oppression of those people. The market mechanisms to make these changes to reduce emissions, they leave those problems in place. So a lot of solutions, actually they don't directly target the environment, they target the broader encompassing causes of climate change, which is that relationship of humans to nature. So I'm not going to go too into detail of these changes. I actually was telling Caroline here that I taught a fourth year course this summer that focused really solely on those changes. So a couple of them, one of them is actually Transform TO. That's an example of what we're talking about here, trying to address more than just environmental problems, trying to address wider problems. So focusing on equity, focusing on economic well-being, you can't ignore that that is important. So yes, focusing constantly and solely on economic growth leads to problems, but people still need access to economic well-being to economic security and safety and stability. So the Green New Deal is a prominent example from this year. Um, it is championed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, especially several other congresswomen in the US, and also by Naomi Klein. She put out a book about it uh, this October. So this Green New Deal, it would be based on these various premises. So ensuring economic well-being for everyone, investing in green jobs. Those green jobs are safer, healthier as well. Um, there is opportunity for this. So there's green jobs that are available. They are on the rise in Ontario and across Canada, while the oil sector jobs are decreasing. So it is beneficial to keep emphasizing this type of growth, these green jobs, um, for all sorts of reasons. People getting jobs is the main one, and they're good jobs. Ensure social equity, so social factors are considered as well, so ensuring social equity, fair opportunities for all, democratic decision making with equal representation. So you should have representation from indigenous populations, from racialized and female populations. Um, so as much as I can rip on Trudeau for investing in oil sands, we can't forget that he actually, when he got elected in 2015, he did implement a representative cabinet. So he had ministers representative of the population. So instead of a lot of white males, as is typical, he ensured that there was equal representation of females in the cabinet to men and various racial groups and indigenous people that represent the actual numbers in the population of Canada. So that was a significant change and he should definitely be applauded for that. That is the type of thing that I'm talking about here in ensuring equal representation in large decisions. Um, as a co-benefit to say this green, these green jobs, this better social equity, better opportunities for all, as a co-benefit, the environment also wins. So we don't need to focus solely on the environment. It can be a positive outcome of these transitions. And these transitions have huge impacts for the majority of people. So not just a specific group of people, large numbers of people are benefiting or would benefit from these types of transitions that are talked about in this Green New Deal. In addition to that, the environment is cared for. So emissions are reduced drastically and environmental degradation is taken into account. So we shouldn't be 
part of my conservation and development course, it talks about this constant narrative of solving environmental problems in a way that takes away from like economic freedoms and from stuff like that. So it's constantly, these conservation efforts historically have been widely contested because they're always imposed onto businesses in some sort of like tax or impact like that. So they diverge from each other. Conservation, environmental conservation, it always takes away from the freedom of businesses historically. So these transformational changes we're trying to get out of that narrative and pose environmental solutions as a co-benefit to primarily economic solutions and social equity solutions. So yes, that, a lot of that stuff is, um, that's more theoretical and political, so it doesn't necessarily apply to your every single day lives and what you do, but there are things that you can do in your everyday lives as well. So think about we learned what we learned in this course, the changes that you can make. So food choices, clothing and consumption choices, so consuming less. I know that it is more expensive to pay for ethical clothing sometimes, like there's companies that do it now. Uh, they do charge more often, they're not dirt cheap. So it's always an option to go to thrift stores or to simply just buy less things. Um, you also are able to support refugee and migrant rights, so that's what we talked about last week. All of these things are related to each other through global processes, especially through this last one of climate change. So even if they don't seem directly related, they are in some way related. Whatever you can, can do to consider social equity, social well-being of others in your day-to-day -day or in your year, if you want to join some sort of committee this year, make that your goal. Anything you can do to advance social well-being of others or help others in some way it doesn't seem like it's connected to the environment, but it's all connected. So remember that. We can all wake up tomorrow and decide to do something different, even if it's small, even if it's buying or finding some way to access one of those reusable travel mugs instead of getting coffee from a disposable cup every day. So small changes like that, small behavior changes or changes that try to address these larger transformations, we can all play a part. And you guys have power. We are in a democratic country. We are in this room. We are thinking about these things. We have opportunities. You guys are young as well. You have time. So you do have power. So what I put here is don't let anyone tell you you can't make a difference because of who you are. I'm telling you, you can make a difference. And that is all for today.